this um, first seminar of a list of seminars that we uh, organize in IHP. So uh, this list of seminars are entitled uh, Funda um, Fundamental Question on Amazing Logic of Molecular Biology. And in fact, uh, this, this uh, list of seminars, all these seminars will be about uh, very interesting topics in molecular biology and are linked to a book that we are currently writing with uh, Misha Gromov, present here on François Kepes, which uh, co-organized uh, this uh, series of seminars. Mm -hmm. And uh, this book is about uh, amazing and uh, brilliant ideas uh, that uh, shaped on the, on the did very good breakthrough in uh, molecular biology. And so uh, every seminar will be linked to a chapter of uh, this book. And we will start today with Michel Morange, which uh, you probably, for uh, most of you already know. So Michel Morange um, is a professor at, uh, at uh, ENS on the University Paris 6. He's director of the uh, Centre de Cavaillès. Um, and um, he did his PhD in enzymology, but also in parallel did a PhD in the, in the philosophy of uh, science. And uh, since, ever since, he had a double competence. He was a um, molecular biology, biologist and also a historian on, of uh, science. And uh, since uh, a few years, he stopped his activity of molecular biology, so he's now really into history and, and philosophy of science, and he's an author of uh, Numerous book, uh, the last one is called uh, Histoire de la Biologie, <coughs> uh, and so he will, uh, will present you today uh, the meanings of molecular revolution in Shelmo. Okay. Can you switch off the light? Please. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much to the organizer. I must say that uh, somehow it was difficult for me. First, because I did not know exactly what you were expecting. Second, because I did not know who will be the people attending this uh, seminar. And uh, so my starting point was a kind of discourse statement done on molecular biology. For instance, uh, molecular biology was a reductionist approach of uh, uh, biological phenomena. It was even a sad chapter in the history of biology. As Ernst Mayer said that the end of his life, somehow nothing was changed in uh, other biological disciplines like evolutionary biology by the development of molecular biology. Or what is very commonly said, is that molecular biology is an ensemble of techniques. OK, so I am somehow tired by this kind of uh, simplistic statements. Uh, first, for many reasons. The first, because it's already uh, 80 years uh, event. The, history of molecular biology started, it's difficult, that in 1920, 1930s, so already more than 80 years, and it was obviously a very long process with different facets. And it's what I want to do today, just to show you the successive transformation of molecular biology. Second, because uh, words like reductive or reductionist are not so simple, what does exactly it mean? to be reductionist, and uh, I, it's among the issues I will address during uh, this lecture. So it will be somehow chronological, starting from the beginning, uh, show, trying to show what were the origins of molecular biology, and, uh, following, okay, and following the different uh, steps uh, up to now, and to raise some issue at the end. So I'm afraid maybe it's far too simple and far too general from some of you, sorry, but uh, uh, it depends probably also on your background in, in biology and in molecular biology. So beginnings mm, of molecular biology, the development of molecular biology from the 1930s, uh, which is often seen as a convergence or 
encounter between genetics and biochemistry. Uh, just, and it will be one of my messages, beginning we are not so reductionist, especially in one group which was very active at the beginning of molecular biology, which was the American phage group headed by Max Delbruck. Probably some of you know Max Delbruck and know his role in the development <coughs> of molecular biology. He chose, he chose a system which was a bacteriophage because it was a simple system but the objective of uh, Max Delbruck was to find laws of reproduction of organisms from the study of this simple uh, model system. And uh, Max Delbruck was not fond of uh, chemistry. He hated, in some sense, chemistry. He found it especially biochemistry. And uh, so the, one of the origins of molecular biology uh, is at least very different. A second thing, on the opposite, I will now turn to microbiology, because it's interesting also to see uh, microbiology, uh, bacteriophage, as we have seen, but also bacteria, uh, played a major role in the development of molecular biology. But when you look now at uh, the long way from the um, characterization of this microorganism end of 19th century, beginning of 20th century, and today with the molecular revolution, what is striking is to observe that, in fact, this movement to understand at a lower level what was happening started from the beginning. Even at the end of the 19th century, it was discovered that many microorganisms were, in fact, pathogens because they were secreting toxins, which were proteins. And so the reduction of a complex process, a disease, to the action of a toxin was already there at the end of the 19th century. And in this case, molecular revolution was not a dramatic change in this kind of studies. And uh, in fact, when you observe what happened in the 1940s, 50s, where progressively the notions of molecular biology entered into microbiology, you can see how progressive it was. I just want, I mentioned here, uh, for instance, the famous Hershey Chase experiment, an experiment of the phage group showing that in bacteriophage it's only DNA that enters bacteria and is responsible for reproduction of uh, bacteriophage. Uh, this experiment was clearly a step towards reduction of bacteriophage to its chemical components, but it was a part of a smooth process. Another example is on another phenomenon which is temperate bacteriophage or lysogeny. The possibility of phages to remain silent within bacteria. It was a very important phenomenon because it was essential for the emergence of the models of regulation, gene regulation, regulation of gene expression. And when you look at this problem, okay, you have a bacterium, nothing happens, and suddenly a bacteriophage is released from this bacterium. So how is the bacteriophage within the bacterium. In the 1950s, you can follow the progressive transformation in this notion of prophage in the following drawing from the group of André Lvov, François Jacob, Eli Volman. Uh, here, for instance, in 1950, you have a representation and you see silent bacteriophage, prophage, are represented by a small circle, like a small organism. Nobody knows exactly what they are. Some years later, in uh, André Lvov, it's a uh, line. You say it's not different. Yes, it is, because line is linear, so it means it's more similar to genetic material. And uh, the same year, Elie Volwan goes slightly further and asks the issue, what are the relations between the genetic material of the prophage and the genetic material of the bacteria, which is represented by a long line? And he considered all the possibilities, you see, different, uh, um, different amounts of uh, the bacteriophage genetic material, an attachment or not to the chromosome of the bacterium. And in fact, the right model is not represented, unfortunately, because the right model is that uh, 
a genetic material of the phage is inserted into the genetic material of the bacterium, which is not the case, which is represented in this slide. But just to show you how progressively a uh, silent bacteriophage was converting into a molecule and a DNA molecule, in fact, uh, some years later. <coughs> okay, so another important aspect of the rise of molecular biology was the emergence of the studies on macromolecules. The notion of macromolecule, the emergence of this notion was parallel to the early development of molecular biology. But what is interesting, once again, first, is that the debate was not uh, about reduction or not. It was about what kind of reduction. Because there was an alternative model, which was the colloid uh, model, telling that at a certain level of uh, matter, you had the colloid states, aggregates, which were responsible for new properties. And so the emergence of molecular biology was an emergence in favor of the existence and role of macromolecules opposed to the existence of these colloids. But it was no more reductionist, no less than the study of colloids. It was different, once again. And second, I wanted to add something which is, uh, I think, important also. It's to remind that uh, it was made, the, uh, it was noticed by Wolfgang Ostwald, the uh, physical chemist, uh, in the beginning of the 20th century, that when you were looking at the different levels in the universe, different size, okay, the chemist was studying simple molecules, but there was a limit. Uh, under the light microscope, you were observing structures, but okay, there was a limit, low at a low level. And between the two, there were absolutely uh, no tools to study what happened, level of colloids or macromolecules. And the rise of molecular biology was also somehow parallel or linked with the development of this new technology, and in particular, for instance, uh, electrophoresis, which is probably one of the most characteristic of molecular biology and even today of molecular studies, just to show you that it was exactly as for the computer. I enjoy this slide for this reason. The first machines were enormous, very expensive, very difficult to manipulate. And today in the biological labs, you have very simple machines on each bench. And uh, so, this is a part of the progress in technology, this reduction to simpler devices. Okay, so it's another part of, uh, of the, um, this movement towards molecular biology. Last point I want to discuss very briefly. As I told you, it's an overview, but in the discussion we can come back and uh, ask many issues on each of these points, if you like. Last point is that you had another form of uh, reductionism in the same year, which was the genetic reductionism. And I think it's important to note that you had always a kind type of confusion between genetic reductionism and molecular reductionism. Genetic reductionism means that in the organism, you can cut somehow the organism into different parts, characters, and each of these characters is controlled by a gene. So, uh, organisms can be reduced to genes and an ensemble of genes. But it's something very different of a chemical, biochemical, or molecular reductionism because the gene remains an abstract object and nobody knows how, what is its precise nature. Uh, I will come back on this point because uh, the relations between uh, genetics and mo molecular biology are complex. And they are still somehow at the origin probably of many difficulties or misinterpretation about what is molecular biology and uh, what is uh, tells about things and so on. Okay, so it was my first part on the origin. So now second part, the 1960s, molecular biology be becomes a well-recognized new scientific discipline. So what did it bring? Plenty of things, but I have made a very short list. 
uh, relation between different classes of macromolecules, the RNA uh, proteins, the genetic code, of course, but also you have uh, regulatory mechanism operating at the molecular level. And I think there is something more in uh, molecular biology. It was uh, evidence for its uh, founders that maybe not all, clearly, but many explanations of biological phenomena can be found at the level of macromolecules. Not all, I think, uh, except probably for some molecular biologists, and I will come back on this extreme case of reductionists. But many phenomena will find their explanation at this level. Okay, so now, uh, just, I will discuss a few points of this uh, now period of molecular biology. Molecular biology has become a discipline. The first is once again the relations between genes on one side and DNA on the other. In fact, with the rise of molecular biology, you had two different movements. The first was to say genes correspond to DNA. So, molecular reduction. The second was to say genes correspond to an information. And the genome is a program, for instance, for the organism. It's some two things which are highly different. One is reductionist, the other is absolutely not reductionist. Let's now focus to the reduction to DNA. One gene, one DNA fragment. As you know, this reduction is not so simple. And the difficulties appeared uh, in the 1960s because, okay, must you include regulatory sequences in the DNA fragments or uh, regulatory sequences present upstream of a gene must be included or not? Okay, you include them, but uh, in some organisms, regulatory sequences are very far from the gene and they are shared with other genes, and so on. So we have plenty of difficulty to say one gene corresponds to this precise fragment of DNA. In it fact... Maybe the fragment, yeah, maybe. Hmm? Maybe not one fragment, maybe combination of fragments, maybe also like a gene. Okay, but in the case, yeah. okay, in the case, for instance, where uh, one element like an enhancer controls different genes, this element will be shared between different genes. So the gene will be this fragment which is common and another fragment which is specific, but it creates other issues because it means that you have in fact interaction between the genes. And so it's not, at least it's a reduction, but with many interactions. So it's, it's not so simple. It was my point to say that uh, reduction in this case was not sim so simple from a genetic point of view, from the point of view of geneticists. And it's even, uh, I think, more serious concerning genetic determinism. You know that in ge classical genetics, the genes were responsible for this, this, this. It was very clear, genes were responsible for the color of the eyes, for the shape of the wings, and so on. Uh, strong determinism, a specific form of a gene is there, you will have the characteristic, special characteristic. Okay, when you enter into molecular mechanism, this kind of determinism is no longer possible. Why? Because when you look at molecules, a molecule is not isolated, it interacts with other molecules, it can be modified, it can be controlled, and so on. So you can no longer keep this very simple form of determinism. Molecular determinism is much more complex than genetic determinism and far less strong than genetic determinism. It cannot be as strong as genetic determinism, I think. Okay, so just to show you that uh, this transition to molecular biology was from the point of view of genes Genetic reduction is genetic determinism, not so simple. Okay, so now 
the characterization of proteins. It's another important part of uh, molecular biology. But some interesting uh, things about that. The first is that it was something very progressive. It's not the same story as DNA. DNA 1953, genetic code 1960, one uh, regulatory mechanism 1961, very simple, and we have very beautiful model. Concerning proteins, I think I have just... No, it's Linus Pauling, just to mention, because he was so active in this process. Um, this is the first model of a protein in 1957, myoglobin, at six angstrom uh, resolution. It was the first protein structure. In 1970, so uh, 13 years later, there were only about uh, no more than 10 proteins that had been characterized at a high resolution. And the progress in the characterization of the structures came later with uh, different steps, genetic engineering, which uh, permitted the preparation of huge amount of proteins, progress in uh, X-ray diffraction sources, progress in computers, of course, and so on and so on. And so you have a real exponential growth of structures of proteins up to now, and the progresses are not, uh, have not found an end, but now you can obtain a three-dimensional structure of a protein in a very limited amount of time compared to what happened at the beginning. And what is the consequence? The consequence, I think, is that uh, the situation has dramatically changed because this three-dimensional structure of proteins are what is important for the design of new drugs. Because by knowing the structure, you can imagine uh, inhibitors, allosteric or competitive inhibitors, and uh, you can after test them. So uh, from the point of view of molecular biology, this structural part of molecular biology, uh, it has never been as brilliant, as powerful than today. Whereas, probably, the other uh, informational part of molecular biology, the results were obtained rapidly, and there were more doubts appearing after the existence of programs and notions like this. So, very different histories of the two. Just one word on regulation. Discovery of regulation, regulation of enzymes, regulation of... Uh, in the control of gene expression. Just to tell you that, uh, in fact, with this regulation, it was clear that molecular biology was entering a new era because it means that you have uh, loops, you have feedbacks, events, and uh, some uh, a systemic vision of molecular phenomena becomes uh, necessary. So, uh, we probably we realized this later, but some people like Denis Thieffry here at the Ecole Normale say that the beginning of systems biology was in the opera model and in, okay, the people who exploited it immediately after, like René Thomas, I think he is not totally wrong. It was the beginning of another vision of a living organism with this uh, existence of these regulations. Okay, so it was a Yoperon model. So conclusion of this part, it's once again, you see reductionism. Yes, I come back on this issue. There were strong forms of reductionism, precisely trying to reduce a huge process to one molecule and the structure of one molecule only. And one good example was the existence of what was called, uh, were called the memory molecules of molecules of memory. The idea is that the behaviors or uh, souvenirs, me memories were encoded into macromolecules directly. And that by transferring these macromolecules, you could change in a recipient animal the behaviors or the memories. And there were in the 1970s famous experiments and studies about which 
macromolecule was doing that. And this kind of experiment, sorry, it's in French, but it's not, I guess, a problem. But the experiment of George Ungar, you are the rat. The rat was trained to, to have a certain behavior, for instance, to avoid the uh, black pot of uh, labyrinth. And uh, the animal was killed, the brain was uh, um, taken, crushed, and uh, extracts of macromolecules were done. They were transferred to a recipient animal, and immediately the animal behaved properly. He has learned the behavior of the dead animal. So these experiments disappeared, but it was clearly totally reductionist. You have a complex behavior, and you say it's due to one macromolecule. All is in the structure of one macromolecule. Was they were reproduced? This kind of experiment? There were many people offering this type of experiments. It never came to applications. Uh, but uh, there were plenty of papers in best journals like Science, Nature, and uh, published this kind of uh, observations. But when the last uh, were reproduced? Uh, last, it's middle of the 1970s. And interestingly, it's when uh, endorphin and encephaline were discovered. Be I think that from the beginning there were some people who were not happy with these experiments of transfer. But when encephaline and endorphin were discovered, it was possible to say, OK, the experiments were not uh, faked, but some people had illusion. They had, in fact, extracted peptides having non-specific effect on the nervous system, and they misinterpreted their experiment. So it was a way to explain past observation without telling that the people have uh, invented the uh, data, <laughs> which probably was the okay case for yeah. some of them. Or self-illusioned, which is another problem in, in science, which can happen also. Uh, May I also make a comment that yeah. you know, some rare diseases can be brought back to a single mutation. So they can be explained on a very reductionist basis, and even treated sometimes with the method that you just mentioned, with a crystal mapping, etc. What kind of process, of, what kind of phenomena can be reduced to one macromolecule? A number of rare diseases. Ah, yeah, so of just, course. Just to the... Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no. Others are much more complicated. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I absolutely agree. In some cases, and I, uh, in genetic disease, you have uh, one, uh, I would single mention, mutation. one single mutation, one effect, and you can explain with that all the effects. No, no. Once again, uh, there were uh, abuses of uh, reductionism in some cases, but in some other, a reductionist approach was uh, powerful. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, my message is that it doesn't work in all cases, not at all, not at all. I reassure you. <laughs> no, and I think I will even show some examples. OK, next step was genetic engineering. And once again, uh, probably because it's now nearly 40 years ago that it happened, it has been forgotten that during, at, let's say, 15 years, molecular biology has uh, provided big uh, schemes big explanations, but no tools, in particular to study higher organisms. So it was a period with uh, very few results, and uh, on the opposite, complex results, because the technology was not uh, correct. But things changed in the middle of the 1970s, and you had, after, a rapid accumulation of uh, molecular descriptions. And OK, so what were the first results with this molecular description? The uh, first one was to characterize, for instance, message exchange between cells and the cell signaling pathways and the growth factors, the action of growth factors, and the emergence of the theory of cancer, which is somatic mutation theory. Uh, I want to pinpoint two points. The first is that, once again, you see that molecular biology did not lead to a reductionist view, because it was a reductionist, but in some sense it shows that interactions were very important, interaction between cells, communication, and so on, even to understand uh, disease. 
So what does mean a reductionist? Yes, it was reductionist because you described components, but the effect was not uh, reduced to one single component. That was my point. But, uh, and the second, okay, there are discussions today about the uh, theory of cancer, but uh, nevertheless, whatever, maybe it's not sufficient, maybe it has to be uh, changed and so on, but it's clear uh, that this description of the signaling pathways was once again a breakthrough and explained many of the phenomena concerning cell division, control of cell division, and so on. So, so first result, uh, it was a focus, a period of focus on DNA and a kind of genocentrism. Uh, if you look at uh, technologies, uh, genetic engineering, you manipulate is eventually DNA. But there is one point which is not understood by people outside biology. It's that if people manipulate DNA, it's because it's much more easy to manipulate DNA than any other macromolecules. If you want to change something in a cell, it's much more easy to introduce a modified form that DNA and to synthesize, the, for instance, uh, altered forms of proteins, that to inject these altered forms of proteins. So to act on living organisms, to modify them, DNA um, is the best way to do it. It's a, it's a path to uh, modification of organisms. And for one very simple reason, I think, which is not because uh, as sometimes you read, biologists are focused on DNA, they were obsessed by DNA and so on. It's simply because DNA structures have been selected because it can easily transmit an information from one generation to another generation. So there is something specific in the structure of DNA which allows a simple manipulation of DNA. Biologists have used a trick that has been forged by natural evolution. But uh, it was nevertheless it's true that for many people they saw DNA coming back, uh, modification of organisms by DNA, genetic modification, and what we were discussing previously, for instance, isolation of genes involved in genetic disease. So a kind of return of a certain form of genetic determinism. Okay, so in some cases it works well, like... Uh, for instance, sickle cell anemia or others, you have a simple mutation and you can explain the effects of the disease by the simple mutation. In some other cases, it's slightly, it's more complex. There are, of course, the modification is responsible for, but the, the path to the phenotype is a very complex one, like even, for instance, cystic fibrosis, which was a great discovery of the gene. Nobody was known about the origin of the disease when the gene was isolated at the end of 1980s. But from the knowledge, progressive knowledge of the gene and of the protein, the way was long to understand all the complexity of the disease. So, uh, Okay, but I think the problem was there were, once again, and uh, I don't say that uh, these today were not useful, but when you look at, you have exactly at the same time the, uh, many groups starting to isolate genes involved in behaviors. And I think, okay, because uh, a gene can be responsible for one disease, why a gene would not be responsible for a specific behavior? conceived as a disease, for instance, at that time, like, uh, for instance, uh, sexual behaviors. And uh, you know that it was a period where people said they have isolated uh, genes involved in uh, mental pathologies, in uh, some specific behaviors, in aggressivity, um, and so on and so on. I don't want to see. There was a plethora of articles uh, uh, going in this direction. Most of these articles were shown later to be non-viable, uh, uh, not really confirmed by later experiments. But I think it reinforced it, and it's a paradox, because as I mentioned, molecular biology 
In fact, for me, it's the beginning of the end of genetic determinism, in the sense that it cannot be so simple as geneticists had imagined. But in these years, it was clear that it permitted a kind of burst, again, of genetic determinism, the idea that we are controlled by our genes and totally controlled by our genes and, and so on. And it also supported the idea that, uh, okay, but molecular biology, it's a technique. And there was an identification between molecular biology and genetic engineering, which is not the case. Genetic engineering are techniques, but they are techniques too uh, for projects uh, different and a project of a science which has a vision of what is important is an organism. Of, okay, a last word in... Uh, Oh, perfect. A uh, last word on the uh, last period, uh, we can say, or not last, uh, before the, the present, but the Human Genome Sequencing Program uh, launched in 1986 and uh, achieved in 2000-2003. Uh, okay. Just a few words about it. <coughs> It's always possible to ask a question, uh, was it the right time to launch it and so on. Uh, it has no historical sense, it happened. But uh, in any case, I think it was obvious that once the structure of DNA was known and once it was accepted that uh, genes were formed of DNA, sequencing uh, the, gene, uh, the whole DNA content of a cell like human cell was something which was reasonable. Okay. So, but as you know, there were the way it, this project was presented was probably not absolutely adequate. And uh, for instance, you had this kind of uh, sentences like, we will read the book of life, or we will know who we are by reading the book of life. So it, there were oppositions, but oppositions were more on the form, uh, new form of science uh, engendered by this program or the, the fact that Monet was now devoted to sequencing and not to more interesting projects and so on. But in fact, the idea is that immediately this program will bring huge results uh, to biology, I think this idea remains strong, which explains that in 2001, when the sequences were published, I think there was an immense disappointment. Because when you read the two articles in Science and Nature, you have plenty of data, but it's difficult to isolate take on messages. If I say that, it's not to say that it was useless to sequence a genome. Think that retrospectively, it's clear that it was, uh, in fact, it changed the work of biologists, the way they are working. It was an extraordinary resources, resource to find sequences, to compare sequences, and we know all these tools now. And it, I think also, something which was not anticipated, it opened to comparisons. Uh, what was important was not somehow the sequences, but the comparison between sequences. And through comparison of sequences, you open the door to evolutionary questionings about uh, transformations and so on. So an absolutely new aspect. But somehow it didn't change. It's my point of view. We enter into <laughs> points that deserve to be discussed. It didn't change the nature of the questions asked by biologists. It's my point of view. We can uh, we'll discuss this uh, later. Okay. Uh, now come to post-genomics and uh, systems biology epigenetics. I think that uh, to understand the discourses, the statements that accompany the rise of these two disciplines, one must understand the previous events, the program, sequencing program, and somehow the initial disappointment. 
it was necessary to say, okay, but it's now that it becomes important. And uh, there was a many statement which flourished that uh, now we will put things together and it will be something radically new. Just to give a quotation of that time by uh, David Bernstein and Patrick Brown describing what can be done with DNA chips and transcriptomics in particular. As you can see, in first part they say we have discovered that in the genome plenty of genes which were known. It's like a new continent, like the discovery of America some uh, centuries ago. And as the discovery of America changed a lot, uh, all the Western uh, uh, countries and all the world in general, it will be the same for the biology. Uh, this knowledge will totally change. And as you see, new technology will make that now it's no longer necessary to have hypotheses or to somehow a uh, new vision, a new logics will emerge spontaneously from the accumulation of this data. I really think that it was a part, in part a strategy to say, okay, maybe there was a program, we said that we will understand who we are at the end of the program, we have not understood, but okay, it uh, now starts the important thing, so it was strategic. Uh, but I don't think that all these statements are, have a strong meaning. For instance, I am not convinced that uh, you have this dramatic uh, um, movement from balance between a reductionist approach and now a global systemic approach or something radically new and so on. I think the transition was more uh, progressive and, uh, than that. This is more political discourse, discourses of political in, uh, politics in science and scientific discourses and scientific statements for me. Okay, just before closing, I want to show you that uh, now if we take one discipline and to show you that the difficulty somehow of a relation between uh, molecular biology and other disciplines evolved and evolved quite positively, very rapidly, and I will conclude after. First, when you look at uh, evolutionary biology and molecular biology, as I mentioned at the beginning, evolutionary biology is considered that molecular biology was physics and chemistry and not a biology. It was very clear in Ernst Mayer. Molecular biology is not biology. But he, because he knew nothing of this, I guess. He was completely ignorant of molecular biology or anything else except ornithology. He was an ornithologist, or he used birds, and the rest he was compared. <laughs> I would not be as uh, strong as you are, but I think he clearly was not a specialist of biochemistry and so on, and he was not interested, and he considered that it was not and essential. And he said a thing about molecular biology, that was wrong. He never said anything right, except for the British members. No, but the problem is that he had the feeling that, in fact, for instance, he said that in 2000, and I think this is uh, wrong, absolutely wrong, that Evolutionary biology has not been changed at all by molecular biology. And this is wrong, I think. You never, cannot say that. never said anything right. I, I read many things. You said everything came to me. Let's uh, change to a, Let's change to another discussion. Um, okay. What were the problems, I think? When you consider uh, evolutionary biologists, they pay the more attention to natural selection. When you are a molecular biologist, uh, you are interested by variations because you are looking for variation, you are seeing variations between organisms. So you have, from the beginning, there was a disagreement. What is the most important in evolution? Variations or natural selection? It's not so, it's an important issue, I think. And naturally, molecular biology said it's variation. And when you look at variations, it's obvious that you have plenty of types of variations. Gene duplication is not the same as the point mutation. Genome duplication is something even more significant and so on. And also because, for instance, if you in Evo Devo, if you 
mutate a gene involved in development, it will have a strong effect on development and so the morphology of the organism and so on. So there were plenty of uh, discrepancies, differences between the vision of evolutionary biologists and molecular biologists at the beginning. But finally, in fact, there were uh, now the situation is much more peaceful, I think. The first, for instance, at the beginning, there were also the arguments that molecular phylogenies will learn nothing about true phylogenies. Because true phylogenies are interested by important characteristics of organisms, and molecular characteristics are not important. Okay, now, who is not using molecular phylogenies? Uh, all people working in classification work molecular phylogenies. Second, uh, evolution and in vitro evolution now has combined with molecular evolution. I've just mentioned the experiment of Richard Lensky, which I think are fantastic because when he started his long-term uh, culture of bacteria uh, in very simple uh, environments, he had not the techniques to look at the variations. The techniques came 20 years later, 30 years later, with high throughput uh, sequencing techniques, but he has kept samples of the cultures at different times, so it was possible to use them again and to characterize the different mutations. And just to show you here, for instance, on in 50,000 generations, and he observed the different types of mutation along the time which has occurred in his uh, culture. So, simply to tell you that. Mm? What period of time when the work was done by Lensky? It's which, which years? It's not the... What kind of a message? What no, kind? The, the, the days, what the period of time, the which, in which year? When, he, when did he start? Because he's not finished. When he started? I started in oh, uh, the 1980s, 1980s, I think. 89? No, I think it's earlier. Earlier? Oh, uh, no, no, but 1980s, about. At the time, it was uh, no uh, possibility of sequence so rapidly. Okay, so to come back to other transformation, there are now also possibility to uh, do the evolutionary studies of isolated proteins. For instance, you can reconstitute ancestral form of proteins, study their properties, and so on. It has been done in some cases. It's a huge work, but something fantastic, I think. And molecular studies and evolutionary studies are combined. And, uh, okay, and now the idea is that, okay, variation is important. Molecular biology can tell you the type of variation, but it does not mean that uh, environment and natural selection is not an actor in the process. For instance, the genes mutation can be there, and they will be only important if there is a change in the environment. So, somehow, there is a combination between these. Just to tell you, okay, when you look at the details, the old conflicts have somehow vanished. And uh, I think just this is okay, this is the experiment. So, neither proteins, you reconstitute the ancestor, you try to understand how the ancestor progressively was modified during evolution, which kind of event, aleatory event, and so on. I have no time, but we can come back in the discussion. So, conclusions. Molecular biologist reductionism, okay, so I've tried to show you that it must be distinguished from genetics, that uh, DNA-centered vision is a methodological bottleneck in some sense more, that a real uh, decision of biologists to say that DNA is more important or more significant, but when you manipulate the living system, it's much more easy to manipulate DNA. The anti-reductionist discourse, which is often seen, for instance, in post-genomics, was many times a strategy, more than probably a reality, it's my point of view. But, okay, it opens to discussion. Uh, is there, at the end of molecular biology, so um, there, are, there have been dramatic change in technologies recently in biology, that's true. But my feeling, but okay, open to discussion, that the interpretative framework has not cha dramatically changed. And 
As a structural part of molecular biology is concerned, it still provides a huge of data, for instance, for the design of new drugs and so on. So it remains a firm pillar of molecular biology. And the last slide is something new emerging, which is a stupid question because we never know what will emerge. So, but nevertheless, uh, what I would say in this debate is it's clear that I think among biologists, sometimes there is a feeling that uh, the accumulation of data is very rapid, but the change in uh, conception so on is more slow now than it has been in the past. As if there was something uh, maybe lacking to really uh, be able to put all this, to interpret all this data. But it's a feeling. Second, also, that in some fields like cancer, for instance, okay, you can continue accumulating mutations, but you have the feeling that uh, you can, you will obtain results, but uh, uh, will it lead to really uh, understand far better the cancer than before? There are doubts, but, but at the same time, I think, uh, are there alternatives? Uh, is there something radically new emerging? Loads of complexity, that's a, a question. Uh, I think so far, but uh, you will discuss. Many biologists, most biologists are somehow reluctant to think that something essential like laws of complexity are uh, lacking. I, I think so, I have the feeling. Doesn't mean that plenty of important results will not emerge, showing dynamics of behaviors and so on. But uh, the question is, uh, are we at the origin of a change as dramatic as was the molecular revolution in the 1930s? That's a question. And as I mentioned, there is no answer. And if there is an answer, we will know it in 20 or 30 years, probably. Uh, so it was only my bad answers. OK, thank you. You mentioned evolution as uh, you know the, the fact that uh, biology had changed in the uh, late in the 1990s and with the genome, uh, genome human genome sequencing that uh, it had changed the work the work of biologists and it had opened up to evolution evolutionary questions and. Um, I just wanted to raise the issue and have your comments on on the on this on this uh, aspect because in some sense uh, it's important on how we see ourselves. Indeed, the discovery, the, the sequencing of a Neanderthal human, for instance, has led uh, Homo erectus as well has led to the notion that. Uh, Homo sapiens had uh, in Eurasia had some DNA from Neanderthal and in uh, where is it? In, uh, no, no, actually in, in, in Europe and yeah, and in Asia uh, some DNA from Homo erectus. So, um, so far, the this course of scientists to the general public had been we are a single race. Homo sapiens is a single race. Now, the fact is that. Uh, these new developments lead to the idea, perhaps, that uh, um, we are uh, Metis. How do you say this in English? Metis. 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 Yeah. And um, and uh, so it's not the, the the theory of replacement, which actually has been very popular these last weeks in France. But it's not the theory of replacement that holds, but it's the theory of Metis. Medicine, medicine, I don't know, the hybridization, hybridization, mm -hmm. yeah, which holds, and so it changes the view about how we see ourselves and also changes perhaps the, the discourse of the scientists to the general public, potentially. Um, just no, no, it, it's an interesting uh, question. Um, and uh, my feeling, but it's a feeling, uh, okay, th this comparison are very important. And th once again, it was something that was not anticipated that it would be possible to sequence uh, DNA from fossils of uh, uh, 
nearly 100,000 years uh, old. So something unexpected. And the results are puzzling because I think, uh, yes, apparently this flux of genes were not equally uh, equal in different parts of the world. And so it means that uh, it's not a full homogeneity. My feeling is that if this result had been obtained, uh, let's say, 70 years ago, it would have probably been uh, exploited by many people to show that human races are different, some are higher than others, and so on. My feeling is that, OK, uh, there were a long period where it was clearly said that there is one human race, uh, full exchange. So these results have not been uh, interpreted in this way, saying, no, you see, we are not the same. We are different. We have a different genetic background, uh, hopefully. <laughs> um, otherwise, uh, yes, it's. OK, it's true that the medicine and this exchange are important, and, uh, uh, it's all, but uh, one must be also very cautious in, against uh, rapid interpretations of the data. I think when, for instance, crossing between Neanderthals and uh, modern humans, it's presented like uh, good Neanderthals and uh, Homo sapiens, who was more aggressive and so, and transmitted the genes of aggressivity, whereas Neanderthal transmit. I think this kind of interpretation must be done with. Uh, we must be very cautious because they are probably very naive, and maybe one day we will never know exactly what was the character of the Neanderthal, for instance. Uh, but uh, it's interesting, in, um, and you are right, it's ambiguous because it can be read from different point of view, this new data, as showing differences between humans or on the opposite, showing the importance of, uh, of mixing and exchange, depending upon what you... Uh, it's clear that I think it raised a lot of interest and, uh, among scientists and among people, but... I don't know, my message would be, be very cautious to, for the interpretations, because... Uh, Perhaps also be very cautious when you talk to, to a, 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 a wider audience. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, no, no, because... Uh, and to say that uh, Homo sapiens is, for instance, is uh, intelligent but aggressive, uh, <laughs> Um, not very honest and so on. I think, okay, genes will never tell us uh, this kind of thing. So it's really an interpretation which is... Uh, mm. But it, you read that now today. And the, the poor Homo Neanderthalis was kind and so, whoop, he was eliminated. But okay, that's beautiful stories. But uh, once again, because we, we expect too much from... Uh, uh, but in this case, uh, in some but sense. I think all these reasons, you can exterminate them much fewer of them, yeah? And there is a kind of obvious rule where the large group usually wins by, by, by oh. all, all the season. About 10% probably. Yeah, but there are, there are plenty, okay, but there are plenty of reasons why is, this ought to happen. For instance, it's clear that Homo neanderthalis was probably best adapted to cold weather. And at the end of the glaciations, probably was less adapted than uh, Homo sapiens. So you do not need to have these uh, dimensions of violence, of uh, goodwill or bad will, or to explain maybe the the replacement of. Uh, it could be an accident. Could be the other way, other way <laughs> around. Yeah. Yes, and there can be accidents. There can be uh, stochastic events and. Uh, privileging one group instead of another, yeah. So, once again, to be very cautious not to... Draw. It's a problem, I think, it's always the same. Some people want to have the answer to the question. Why Homo sapiens said not Homo neanderthalis? Because, and you have one sentence and everything is explained. That's a danger. <laughs> yes. To kind of sort of continue on this thing, uh, so I, I work in an institution, Ecole de Mama, quite, quite close here, where people would agree with your 
statement that things have become too genocentric because many of my colleagues they work on epigenetics and that sort of stuff, so they quite agree that there's more than just genes. But all the same, <coughs> they're still incredibly sort of mechanism oriented. So if you really want to understand something, you have to know the mechanism. So what about this distinction that we were taught earlier about uh, uh, the distinction between proximate and ultimate causes? If you want to understand why, why is something going on? Okay, for genocentric, it was after the, I mentioned the, the expression after the beginning of genetic engineering, so at the beginning of the expansion of molecular biology, because it was genocentric. I agree that uh, epigenetics has, has changed this vision of genocentric. Even, I think, so, something which must be reminded is that you have uh, epigenetics because you have genetics, and uh, epigenetics <laughs> cannot exist without genetics. No, but... Uh, uh, the, uh, nevertheless, and the history of organisms probably also it's something to keep in mind. Uh, but it's mechanistic, yes. Uh, molecular barges make, remains mechanistic and explanation remains so far mechanistic, uh, dominant e types of explanations. And, but uh, biochemistry was mechanistic. And my feeling is that epigenetics is close to biochemistry. Yes, it is. It's, uh, so it's also mechanistic yes, as like can... So, do we need also to consider then sort of the more ultimate causes of mm -hmm. things that we... Sort of evolution is typically about the ultimate causes about... Yeah. Yeah. But uh, what exactly... Okay, I agree. Um, um, this form of mechanistic explanation is strong, but... Uh, well, it's successful as well, isn't it? To a certain degree at least. Mm -hmm. S sorry? It's successful as well, to a certain degree at least. Mm. The mechanistic explanation. Yeah. I mean, I always come with my own uh, point of view. From the no, 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 no. We are obliged to look for molecular basis of the diseases. Without an understanding of the molecular diseases, we can't start uh, a program. But what can be said is that uh, mechanistic explanation is nevertheless typical of chemistry, biology, but uh, less typical of physics, for instance, where in physics you have other types of explanations of, uh, like by the existence of laws, of uh, relations, of uh, symmetries, and so on, which are different types of uh, explanation. Mechanistic explanation is very, has become characteristic of uh, at least biology. Uh, you use some term like physical, if you use like molecular dynamics or something, you apply physical law to absolutely your mechanism. Yeah, yeah. Mm. No, you are right. And it's always difficult because biology has no frontiers. And when you are doing molecular dynamics, you are entering uh, uh, physics and using concepts and notion of physics. And so in this case, yes, you, are, you have different ways of explaining. And, uh, but it's uh, precisely, if I may, but you, the example of proteins. The mechanistic conception of protein was very strong at the end of the 1990s with nanomachine, micromachine. And then you had the dramatic change, I think, in the study of proteins with the rise of molecular or development of molecular dynamics. It, it anticipated, but there were new tools, new ways. And now you have a vision of protein which is totally different, I think. Far less mechanistic, you are right. But up to the point, uh, that sometimes I wonder whether this field is still fully biological in some sense. Uh, uh, the study of proteins now, when you see the models, you, it's very different from the model found in other branches of uh, biology. You have energetics, you have population of molecules, statistical uh, mechanics, something... Well, most biologists are not familiar with that. And you probably... You work in this field? Yeah, I work in this field, yeah, but I'm in yeah, but you, two fields, so I'm, I'm but you I'm a biologist, but I work a lot with structural biologists, and the idea is to connect the mechanistic with the physiology. Okay. Yeah. But when you speak with a traditional uh, biologist, you probably see that, for instance, concept of molecular dynamics are not easy to, no, no, yeah, to yeah. introduce. Yeah. But just to follow on this thing is sometimes when you are talking about uh, reduction in science or reductive approach in science, especially in genetic the idea of energy, there's sometimes to not want to put biology in different sub science in different class is not productive too, because if we look at system biology, synthetic biology, they are a bit an evolution of molecular biology and genetic engineering, but it's difficult to see 
Uh, do we don't risk to just separate too much things by, let's well, say, we're going to make a department of no, no, but sure. and biology and they will just look at big data and find No, 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 no. But I, I agree that it's bad to separate. But my starting point was more to uh, oppose some uh, strong statements like uh, molecular biology was too reductionist. Precisely to, uh, attributing one specific characteristic to molecular biology on 80 years. But I would agree with the opposite that you, in fact, you have different disciplines where one aspect or is more important than another. And for instance, system biology, system view is more significant. So you have not uh, uh, one discipline with one precise type of approach, but you have different disciplines where one approach is more important than another. The other, the more interesting is when you mix. Uh, yeah. yeah, 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 absolutely. Uh, and uh, yeah, so it mess, it can be, I don't know whether there are probably some encounters lead to nothing because of the fields were not uh, mature or it was not ripe for uh, an interaction. It's difficult to know also when two uh, approaches, different approaches or two fields are will interact fruitfully or well, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, it's difficult to anticipate this, um, I think. But uh, yeah, no, no, it's, you have a, a poly, uh, different approaches with different emphasis put on different aspects and the permanently changing spectrum of relations. That's my feeling. So, I, I think I totally relate to, um, to basically your main point about reductionism and, um, and also the fact that this uh, um, like systemic uh, discourse is mainly political. But I also feel that, um, you know, compared to the biology of the 90s, the framework, at least the way I see it, uh, is, uh, um, is uh, very different in biology. Um, and uh, I can uh, isolate to try to be more specific, three areas where this may be the case. And one is, I think, evolutionary genomics, and you mentioned it with this, you know, uh, investigations on, for example, protein universe, uh, genome duplications. So there, there was a sort of a, um, I guess, population genetics was born um, without any data, and now we're forced to have data to deal with, so that all the theory that we produce has to be, you know, uh, sort of uh, uh, constrained by this data, as to explain this data, so the, um, the framework is, is more similar to quantitative sciences now. Of course, there's people from different backgrounds, because like you say, a biologist that does not know molecular dynamics, but um, this is, these are areas where people converge from different fields. So another area like this, um, maybe is um, this quantitative physiology, where people are trying to um, define laws for cell growth. And, they, and, and this case, I think, is interesting, because they're going back um, um, to before the molecular biology uh, revolution, where there were like other approaches, like this Copenhagen school, and they're trying. They cite these papers. They they say that this is in their discourse probably, but they say that they want to sort of link their research to uh, to these guys, and also maybe um, this um, single cell gene expression, single cell physiology, single cell genomics uh, stuff, where people are forced to deal with. Uh, again, uh, some of these are technological, but I think it's not only technological, it's really areas where people um, have a different way of asking. Like, because uh, one of the things you say that uh, for me was, I was like, I don't know, <laughs> um, is that the main questions are, are the same uh, um, as, for example, in the 90s. I don't no. Know. no, 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 no. I, I would not like to leave this feeling. I, there are plenty of new things and new approaches. I just wanted to say if it, But you in a sense of different framework. Maybe it's not like as big as a molecular biology revolution, but 
at least uh, I see this as attempts of shifting the framework, not yeah. towards less re or more reductionism. That's totally no, no, but you are absolutely right. Uh, just what I wanted to to tell is that if you look at, for instance, DNA RNA protein relations between macromolecules or respective roles of macromolecules, even if RNAs have found new functions and so on, but nevertheless, this framework remains. Yeah, but after like Newton's law, nobody is questioning Newton's law, but then. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, those are, that's like the, yeah. the things you build on. But it has not been replaced on something different. Um, it's, so it's, uh, because uh, some people have said that Michael Burgi was dead and so on, so I think it's absolutely it's not dead, it's, uh, it's still there, this message. But you have plenty of, of new developments, and some of them, in fact, pre-existed, anticipated, and were somehow forgotten during one period of time, and... Uh, uh, develop uh, slightly later. At the same time, when you say, the, for instance, the population genetics emerged at a time when the gene was not known, so it was normal to be abstract. Now we know what is a gene, what is a mutation, and uh, okay, uh, we can bring and articulate this new um, uh, information with population genetics, it's not always simple because... Uh, yeah, but yeah, but it forces to totally change uh, the frame. Of course, there are things that population genetics that remain uh, uh, you know, true, but uh, then you have to describe you know, the process of mutations, the constraints of the process of mutation, the different kinds of mutations, the global, local... Uh, yes, but because also some people, I think, in this case, consider that these limitations are not limitations. For instance, um, during a while, many population geneticists said it's not a problem if we don't know the nature of the gene, the nature of the mutation. The theory is still valid, whatever this limitation. And somehow it's not always easy to say no, yeah, it can bring you. An yeah, there was a plan. Old and, and yeah. Data, yeah, yeah, there was a, it was not so, so obvious to do. But uh, um, yes, you have plenty of. Uh, exchange new fields appearing, but it's up to you. I don't you didn't have this in the 90s, like in the 2000s and now you have this, and if I compare like between the 80s and the 90s, I don't see this change. So I see more change between the 90s and the 2000s than, uh, uh, than between the 80s and the 90s. Yeah. Uh, between the 80s and the 90s, I'm going to see a straight line. And, and then and now I see a lot of uh, branching. Oh, yes. But uh, it's true, a uh, synthetic biology system, biology and so on, so it was new. Uh, but nevertheless, I... Uh, but it, maybe I'm wrong, I don't... S it's difficult still to say what will be the, know, yeah, the one really with, which, which will become dominant. Line, uh, uh, yeah, no, no, you, you are right. And, uh, and, but also it's difficult to distinguish between discourses, statements and... Uh, reality, because many are uh, made to push new approaches or to say that it's radically new, a new vision. For instance, just we men didn't mention it, but precision medicine, which is uh, quite fashionable today. Personally, I don't see exactly what will emerge. Why? Why I don't see? <laughs> Because, uh, for instance, precision medicine, you look at genes, uh, susceptibility genes. And you, hmm? yeah. Go ahead. and uh, you see that for one disease, for instance, like uh, autism, you have uh, more than 300 genes with slight. Okay, what can you do with such type of information? What can you do? You have to stratify patients. Uh... Yes, but you have one patient who has, among these 300 genes, uh, 20 genes with a slightly higher probability to develop autism and maybe 20 forms of genes with a lower probability. Okay, and so on. <laughs> what we are trying to do is to uh, classify patients and then develop uh, treatments for in different classes. Okay, but in a very simple, yes, I agree, in a very simple... Targets at the same time, it's impossible. But if you have, let's say, three or four, you can uh, still treat uh, the problem with a combination of treatment, something yeah. like this. But the, the problem remains what will be the significant uh, rears, the significant disease, the significant markers, which can be really useful in practice, no? 
So it's not right, a, right. a general principle, precision medicine, okay, but uh, what is important is what kind of uh, markers, what kind of uh, genes, what kind of will be really useful in the future. And this, I think, is not so simple so far, no? Yeah, true, true. <laughs> Once I have the, the, let me just come back a little bit from the, to the beginning, uh, to reductionism. I, uh, I have already discussed it with you uh, over the post. That I think uh, we can attach two or three more adverts to this, uh, and then we arrive to uh, the systems biology approach of today. So be, beyond reductionism, there is also robustness, uh, which is a consequence of, uh, of uh, redundancy of the different pathways that connect uh, targets of uh, molecular biology. So from reductionism via redundancy and robustness, we can get to complex systems, which we can try to treat with the network approaches of, of today. Okay, so I think we can link molecular biology, which is still a very, very important approach to what we are trying to do uh, today, to, these systems as a whole. But that's also a reduction in that approach. It's just more global, but it's also a reduction. Yeah. So there are only two ways to do for reductions. Either yeah. you use reduction approach, you do nothing, you just stop. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Why you somewhere you have to be you? Yes. It's because it's so complex. And no, because the language, language, by nature is reductions. If you have no reduction, say yeah, it's so expressible in the language. So I say, oop. Language, structure of the language, everything we used to work with is Greek and interrupted by certain special rules. Nothing which is not reduction is expressible in language, either mm -hmm. normal or mathematical. And say no reduction is just empty word. I mean, absolutely. But we never, ever anything came from that. We just say, oh, we don't like it, we were nervous. So, so we go to philosophy and science. That's it. Language is reduction. This is essence of our thinking is reduction. There is no other thinking. Just I will bubble, bubble, bubble. Well, this is not reduction. So there is no point to be yeah, skeptical and afraid of being reductions. Yes, but I would say more analytical in the sense of uh, Descartes. It means what we, what we do in science is to reduce a problem. There are many components. So we characterize the components and we try to see after how it works together. Uh, so it's not reductionist, it's the same place that when you have something complex, you try to decompose a problem into uh, less complex uh, components, try to understand the components and have to come back to the whole issue. Uh, I would prefer to speak about analysis and uh, I think in science you do that. Because, as you said, the language is uh, we analyze, we separate in the language also. And, uh, but in science, we do that. We analyze, we take a huge problem and decompose it into parts and uh, try to understand the different parts. And after, we try to see how the parts interact. And it's, it's, a, it's a point. In physics, something is not a part. When you have interaction of objects, and then you can conceptually feel it's not a part. But there is no counterpart on this biology. That's the problem. It's not that this is a reduction or not. There is an underlying new structure discovered in physics. In biology, they're not discovered. It's something else. I mean, they're not of a very different nature. And so mm. that's the, the, the fact. Yeah, that's uh, okay. I mean, yeah, no, that's so a difficulty. You, 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 you don't expect it, but you do some the other problems. I think the major problem now, a general obvious problem, that you don't know how to handle large data. You have large data, they're not amorphous. We don't know how to classify them. Computers don't, don't help. And this is an obvious technical problem which has to be solved. Right? This is, a, I mean, it's not philosophical, very technical problem. You have huge data, they very amorphous, how to systematize them, make them available to everybody. Because most things going to the data banks, you can't read them because then the language you don't understand usually. And then there is no standard in biology. You need standard. Like what, what happens to chemistry at some moment, but otherwise you have to develop standards. You need standards. And which, of course, not for people, but for computers. And this doesn't exist. So this is a very technical, but absolutely <coughs> necessary thing. You need tools which are technical, kind of logical. Before, of course, you can discover new biology immediately, but not indirectly, you can come to new things. I think that's it's a bit what uh, synthetic biology tried to do. To no, but it's not, not it's biology, it's, it's the analyzing the data because they're not standardized. Ah, it's not, okay, yeah, right. it's before you start creating new things, you have to understand what you have. And that's very difficult because, you know, you produce much more data in biology than computers can handle. And if computers, of course, can't organize it, there is no way, no idea how to organize all that in biology. People don't know how to do it. 
perhaps it's also for the gene ontology at that well, yes. mm -hmm. But this is underway, isn't it? Mm -hmm. This is underway. People try to do the first, but it's not done yet. And, no, it's very difficult, it's very complex. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a technical, very difficult technical problem. So this is like the real thing we have, have to be solved. Yeah, yeah. 30 years ago, statistics was about to get the maximum amount of information about the minimum of data. Now, yes. sorry, now right. statistics has become the filter. <laughs> Yes, in your last slide you mentioned you had the question what is new and 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 talk about the laws of complexity. Uh, I'm wondering whether the introduction of synthetic approaches in, in, in biology may not be something that goes into the direction of changing the way we ask questions and, and have some a different a, a true change uh, uh, in the way we, we, we think biology should be uh, working. So I would like to have your comment. Yeah. No, no, uh, I will say something maybe that will not please everybody, but among the young, new uh, biological discipline, I have the feeling that synthetic biology is probably one of the most significant, I would say. It, it, probably because there is, for two, uh, no, for one major reason, because uh, the idea that it will allow really to check the state of our knowledge on biological objects, and it's something I think which is new. Not so much for the application, which is another side of synthetic biology. If, and yes, and testing that we have understood uh, the principles of life, or we have a, a good description of living systems, because yeah, we... I would say, even not testing, but uh, uh, having the possibility to answer questions by synthesis rather than anal analysis, and the complementarity between analysis and synthesis may have the potential to disrupt our concepts in biology. Mm. And the second change which will maybe follow is that the activity of biologists will no longer be to observe what exists in organisms and how they behave and how, but to build organisms. Uh, like chemists in the 19th century changed from observing to synthesizing new and new molecules and new. Yeah, because if you look at the evolution of chemistry, it's clear that the introduction of synthetic approaches that are just in their infancy in biology, but this introduction of synthetic approaches uh, really changed the concepts in, in the field of, of chemistry and allowed the emergence of new theories. So mm, I, I was wondering whether you considered, but you already answered, that synthetic approaches in biology may have the same capacity of uh, uh, raising new, mod new models or even new theories, a new way of thinking what biology is. And even if it doesn't work, I think that's what is strong with synthetic biology, because failure can be very instructive. And, uh, yeah, but, uh, okay. But after, I, uh, you have probably your own answers to this issue, what you see. Uh, I was asked by Mr. Gromov to see what is the most important uh, discovery in the last five years I don't know, but you have probably, uh, each of you has different answers that would be interesting to share, because uh, if you see it in the last five or ten years, what is the most significant result that change, will change the face of biology in the next coming uh, decades. It's not easy, but, uh, but it's a good way to... Okay. If you say discovery of various proteins, it will be so crucial. Yeah. When they yeah. came up, how long is that? The discovery yeah. of fluorescent proteins, so that was in the 1980s, was that? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, yes, yes. No, no, it's true. It was also in me. That allowed lots of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. How long right. it took? How long, how long did it take to, to be appreciated and to be, become the major telling tool? Yeah? I don't remember, but at least more than 10 years, I think. Five, ten years. Pretty fast, right? Yeah. Five, ten. Yeah.
to the file here, and we say more, it's more technical than the thing, is the rise of cryo -EM microscopy. It allows us to reach mechanistic level of protein, and soon we can imagine, we will see enzymology in a visual way. And fluorescent protein is also... Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have also the possibility to activate, for instance, nerve cells by, uh, uh, by light opto genetics, and uh, which is also something for the neurobiologist, I think, quite uh, yeah, but see, uh, radically new. No, but you know, not nothing came from that. The people who do that, they look at the brain, they understand zero before and mm -hmm. zero after. More or less. <laughs> uh, no, because now they, are they have the possibility, it's like synthetic biology, I think, they have the possibility to activate one gene circuit and see what no, happens. No, see, but they don't, uh, that doesn't seem to be, there was any progress in the physiology for the last 20 years, whatever they were doing. They have, have data, they completely kind of, you know, not, not consequential, consequential, and some of them misinterpreted all. all. Then these new techniques don't help because they don't know what to look for. It's very different from molecular biology. This goes and really develops, and there it doesn't develop. It's very interesting compare. Why? But, they block with something, and we don't know by what. But maybe in the general, in generally, yes, for neurobiology, but in some, there are some specific questions, for instance, in the uh, role of cells in the hippocampus, or that can be really solved with this technology. So maybe not at the high level of how the nervous system is organized, there will be immediate answer, but I guess the new technology can be used for very precise... Uh, of course, no, no, the technology are coming there, but that's very interesting to compare. You, it's really development at the same time of molecular biology and neurophysiology. Incomparable. The progress of molecular biology in that. It's incomparable. Why? People yeah. who don't have effort there, and they learn as, much, as little as you learn, and they learn in one half a year. The problem is probably more difficult. Probably no, difficult. or maybe the people are not smart enough. They, they have wrong ideas, what they look for. Many things they say, what they want to find, they look at as, as uh, not, not right. Yeah, but it's a part of the fact that it's more difficult if you have, not, if you have wrong ideas. <laughs> <laughs> You look what Francis Creek was doing before and after, yeah, it's not molecular biology, and comparable to what we're saying, we were saying, we became really stupid men. We were saying, right, and like we were saying, we're stupid. That's what happens right. right. when you, you work on your own. Right, I was saying, with you, yeah, I was actually doing the same <laughs> So, but we all mentioned uh, more technological breakthroughs. I can mention mm -hmm. another one, CRISPR, yes. but these are all, they're yeah. not really scientific. We allowed some scientific breakthroughs, but we all mentioned no, no, but scientific, it's great stuff, it's great ideas. But scientific is very kind of, as if there is good and bad things, scientific are not scientific. They're great ideas, great phenomena, how we call them material. I mean, scientific is a wrong word. We use it as a, a scientific value to something. It's just knowledge. And it's the discovery. Yeah, in the case I mentioned CRISPR when I answered Mr. Gromov previously, so I'm happy that you mentioned it. But I think in this case, it's. Really, the sentence of uh, it was Anderson, the physicist, the more is different. Because I think with CRISPR Cas9, okay, cut DNA, it was already existing, but it wasn't very efficient. Now it's more efficient, more precise, more uh, simpler, less expensive. But I think it opens possibilities that did not exist before, in some sense. So, uh, probably it's, uh, it's really. After what will happen, uh, uh, maybe uh, the modification of the germline is not what will happen. There will be plenty of other use of uh, this tool, different from what uh, those who were which were discussed uh, earlier. Well, the fundamental discovery of the immune system of Macaque, yes. which yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 exactly. Thank mm -hmm. you.